Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. The title of today's webinar is Make Smarter Decisions with Exceptional Network and Service Topology. It is sponsored by Tom Sawyer uh, Software. Uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, points before I go to the agenda. Um, you can uh, log questions uh, through the system. Um, we will actually deal with those at the end. Um, also, you can tweet uh, using the hashtag that you see on the screen there. And uh, both the slides and this webinar will be available for review and download uh, in 24 hours' time. So to introduce myself, uh, I'm Pete Delmore from the uh, DM Forum. Uh, I look after uh, all the portfolio of assets that we have as a forum. Now, in terms of uh, the agenda uh, and introductions for uh, today's session, uh, I'm going to spend a, a few minutes talking about what the forum is doing around customer-centric management. Uh, then going to hand over to uh, uh, Tom Sawyer, and in particular uh, Josh, uh, being good within that. John is uh, Josh is a uh, solutions engineering manager for uh, Tom Sawyer Software, and then we are going to move to uh, Dave Gunawan at CenturyLink, um, who's a, uh, a lead engineer. He's done some very exciting stuff uh, utilizing uh, some of the Tom Sawyer uh, software assets. We're then going to have some time at the end for uh, wrap up, and in particular, any uh, questions that are, are outstanding. Um, and we should be uh, finished uh, within the hour. So that's the uh, uh, agenda. In terms of um, the uh, forum, uh, the forum has been doing a lot of work recently to uh, hone and focus its efforts in a number of uh, strategic program and strategic project areas. Uh, one area which is very uh, critical and important uh, both for our members and for the industry at large is really customer-centric management. And from a, an ambition perspective, uh, the forum uh, wants to be seen by our members uh, as providing a complete customer management strategy uh, which enables and produces brand loyalty, revenue growth, churn reduction, acceptable margins to the world of converged digital services. So it's very grand and very ambitious, uh, but that is the intent of the activities that the forum is involved with to support customer-centric uh, management. In particular, this embraces the customer experience and also the um, customer experience and also the uh, big data analytics area. Um, if you look at what we have from a, a base level, we obviously have a set of best practices which support adopting a standardized approach. Uh, frameworks, which uh, you should all be familiar with. Uh, we also have a number of uh, guidebooks, uh, metrics, maturity model, etc., around customer experience uh, manage, uh, management. Uh, from a, uh, a CMI uh, perspective, there's a lot of work that's being put into building a, a management index um, that has a whole set of different metrics that enable you to determine uh, for your human organization the customer experience that you're actually delivering. An area which is very relevant <clears throat> to the topics coming up is around uh, big data and what you can do uh, with the data in particular that you can extract out of the, uh, the network, how you can use in the case of uh, Tom Sawyer, various visualization tools uh, to get the most uh, value and use out of that information. Um, a lot of our uh, focus around big data analytics is around um, not building these um, reference models or um, 
uh, metrics just for the sake of it, but making sure that they are driven very directly off uh, user cases, real life user cases. Um, and as part of the uh, rollout of the whole program uh, around analytics, it's all to do with uh, identifying and finding um, not only incremental and new user cases, but real life uh, pilot and deployments using uh, these reference models uh, that are being produced. So in a, in a real snapshot summary, these are the activities and, and deliverables and capabilities that we have as a, a forum to support the industry, to support our members in delivering uh, customer-centric management, all uh, built on and focused around user cases and real relevance to achieving that objective. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Josh, if I may, from Tom Sawyer. Over to you, Josh. Thanks, Peter. All right. Uh, so as Peter said, I'm Joshua Feingold. I'm the Solutions Engineering Manager at Tom Sawyer Software. Uh, basically what that means, it, Solutions Engineering has a bunch of paradigms, but I, I do uh, the management for all of the pre- and post-sales customer-facing engineering, uh, development of demos, um, showing our products to customers, helping them with any uh, any questions they have during the development process. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about who Tom Sawyer Software is. Uh, so as a company, we're the leading provider of software and services uh, to enable customer organizations to build highly scalable and flexible data relationship, visualization, and analysis applications. Uh, we are specialists in the field of graph visualization, layout, and analysis. Uh, and uh, beyond those uh, core areas, we also work in a broader area of data unification and data management so that people can see and understand what they're doing with their data. Uh, we are based out of Berkeley, California. We have international offices uh, across the world, uh, and we have 24-7 customer support. Um, we've been doing things in this area. We started out in layout and visualization and analysis 20 years ago. Uh, over the past several years, we've really moved into a uh, higher level uh, data management and data visualization uh, type of product. So we provide uh, visualization for a number of very large companies that I'm sure many of you have heard of. Uh, from Telenor uh, in the telecom space and CenturyLink uh, to Cisco and other large networking um, companies as well as CA and other large uh, software OEMs. And so now uh, the question is why visualization? How is this important to you? Uh, so visualization is sort of a very broad term. Uh, and in fact, it's a broad term because it applies to a variety of different fields. Uh, you can use it in network design, fault management, uh, fault monitoring, capacity uh, planning, uh, network performance management, inventory management, service activation. Um, and what I'm going to be going through today are several business problems uh, kind of at a very high level view uh, of what are the problems that exist in these particular areas? And how has Tom Sawyer helped customers uh, with our expertise overcome the problems that they were facing to come up with a better solution? Um, and I'm going to be doing this at a very high, uh, very high level. Um, so that, that will be, we, we won't be delving into many of the gritty technical details. So let's talk about grid monitoring. Um, this is grid monitoring for a uh, electrical utilities company. Uh, what we're going to be seeing are demo screenshots, uh, genericized data, but this is all 
real uh, foundation work that was done for uh, applications that are in use. So uh, one problem with grid monitoring is that you have data distributed among several sources. Right, uh, Power grid is a great big thing. Um, you have data about different types of entities. You have substations. You have devices in the substations. You have power stations. You have power lines. You have all kinds of things. Um, they all need to show up and they all need to work together. Uh, the data is often hierarchical, which means that substations have devices within them. Those devices may have sub-devices. Um, you, you need to represent uh, geographical data, um, but you don't want to necessarily put it in the exact spacing that it is out in the world because that keeps you from getting data as dense as you want it to be. Um, statuses within the grid change quickly. Uh, However, the overall topology of the grid is fairly stable, which means that if you go and you check everything all at once, you end up wasting a lot of time. Uh, and you also want to have some way to visually draw your eye uh, to areas that need attention within the grid. Right. So here we can see this is a screenshot of a mid-level within here. So this is a, a portion of the grid for a small area. Uh, if you look toward the center, uh, the low center of your screen, you can see that one of these uh, icons that represents a substation is marked with a red X. And on the far right, uh, there is a substation that is marked with a uh, yellow triangle. So that you can see that these are areas that have a critical or a warning status associated with them. And we're going to delve into this a little bit more, but this is you know, just to give you an idea uh, of what you're seeing here before we talk about it. Right, so we want to unify all of these data sources under a single core application schema. Right, so what that means is that we are going to take data from all of our different sources, and we are going to first, before we can visualize it, we are going to find a way uh, to talk about all of these different types of entities in the same context. And then, because we have all these different types of entities, we're going to assign different types of graphical representations to those objects, including different badges that can be associated with different statuses, uh, different icons that can be associated with different device types. Uh, as I said before, what we were looking at in the screenshot um, is a mid-level view that's showing some subsection of the overall grid. Uh, and this is what we call a nested drawing. Right, so there is an overall drawing that shows the overall architecture. There are lower level drawings that show uh, the actual devices. But what we're seeing here is a mid-level drawing so that you can go all the way out, have a very high level understanding, go all the way down and have a very precise understanding. Or if what you're looking for is a mid-level understanding, you only see the type of data and the level of detail that you need to understand what you need to understand. And this leads to much more human comprehensible data. So we want to constrain for a geographically hinted placement. What that means is that in the drawing you're seeing behind you, or behind the text here, uh, the, the icons at the bottom of the screen represent icons that are south of icons that are higher up. Uh, and east to west works the same way. So this is geographically hinted. The relative positions of all of these are correct. However, we don't waste a lot of space because there are you know, miles between substations or whatever. Uh, we have set up so that the query on the uh, status data runs often, and the query on the topology runs rarely. Right? So we, we can use the central data model, but we can use different rates of data acquisition uh, where we expect the rates of data acquisition to be appropriate for each subsection of the application. And we can use the visual cues, right, such as the red X or the yellow triangle to show statuses to make it very easy and intuitive for your users. Uh, in this case, this would be uh, technicians or managers uh, to understand the data they're seeing without having to scroll down through giant tables of data. Right, so let's move on to cable schematics. Uh, this is um, a pretty different application of visualization. 
so cable schematics, if you work in uh, the networking or telecom space, you know have very specific layout needs. Uh, they are often made by hand uh, in CAD software where a, you know, a, a technician sits down in front of a computer and draws up all the connections uh, as they exist inside of uh, the networking device. Uh, this is time consuming. It's difficult to maintain. It doesn't – if you have a central database that's supposed to store these, it won't automatically update. You have to go back and manually update them. And then if you update the database, you have to then go back and update the drawing, and it, it's kind of a vicious cycle. right? Um, so you can use visualization software obviously, to, to speed up this process. All right, so this is a cable schematic uh, viewer. That This is a prototype for an actual application again. Uh, and you can see here that we have a cable schematic uh, following all the rules for drawing cable schematics. And what we've done here, uh, is translate the logical constraints uh, into drawing layout rules, right? And so what this does is it demanualizes the process, right? We have automated this drawing generation. Uh, so now when you need a drawing, you can have one instantaneously. You know, your technician doesn't have to wait for uh, something to be pulled out of the archive. You just, you know, or, or, or wait for a drawing to be updated if an updated drawing hasn't been created yet. He can go and apply the changes in the field uh, and then commit those changes either visually using this as an editing space or apply the changes to the database and the next time someone needs to bring up that drawing, it will automatically be made for them. Right? So th this really uh, dramatically enhances just through the power of using automated layout and visualization uh, the speed and efficiency with which you can manage your uh, network connections. Right, and uh, I'm not going to belabor this point too much, but this is a one-line diagram. Um, if you work in electronics, you are probably familiar with this type of diagram. This is from a uh, canonical data set uh, for drawing these types of diagrams. And again, you know, this is often a very time-consuming, labor-intensive proce intensive process to create these types of diagrams. And just by figuring out what the data is and what the rules are, you can develop an automated process that takes away the laborious and time-consuming task of creating these diagrams. Uh, so now we've got a telecom example. Right? So we want to understand our microwave network. We have a, a cellular system. Uh, there are microwave towers that transmit this data to each other. Uh, and we want to be able to view our network data loads. Um, we need to know what's the maximum bandwidth that a particular connection between towers can handle, uh, how much of it is being utilized. We want to view the components of the tower, and we want to understand the structure of the network. All right. We want to know where are the natural clusters within the network, uh, what's, what's the best connection that we have uh, from one tower to another, uh, how robust are these connections. And so here, uh, in our previous examples, we were primarily focused on just the drawing component, but there's more to data visualization than just that, and a lot of the value comes in understanding the coordination between a drawing type visualization, a tree, a table, and an inspector is what we see here. All right, so we can add additional value um, just by thinking about how we can place data together and create simple but useful visualizations. Right, so um, we, we need to translate the most critical information into user interface cues. Right? So what that means is, you know, it is a connection being heavily utilized? Um, we can show that with color. Right? Uh, or what is the total bandwidth that I'm allocating so I know, you know what are the necessary upgrades that I would need to make if this is already a massive bandwidth, you know, a, an incremental upgrade might not matter. If this is a very small bandwidth to begin with, I might need to only make a small increase for the percent utilization to go down significantly. Right? So in this visualization, um, the line width represents uh, 
the total bandwidth, and the color represents the current utilization. Uh, in addition to that, when I select a tower, and I have a tower selected, let's jump back just so you can see it a little better. You can see that we have also highlighted in uh, the tree on the right and the table on the bottom additional information that is associated with that tower. Right? So now, without cluttering the visual space inside the drawing, uh, users can understand what is happening at a much deeper level. So now we want to talk a little bit about analysis. Uh, and how that can help you understand value, uh, or help, help you derive value for, uh, for your users. So what we see here is uh, we've run a couple of analyses on the same drawing that we were looking at just a second ago. And you can use these types of analysis algorithms to reveal hidden information about the context of your network that you can't get necessarily just by looking at it visually, and certainly not by looking at it in some sort of tabular form. Right? So cluster detection. Uh, clusters are what we see the background colors of each of the towers is denoting here. Right? So, so these are natural clusters. Um, they are groups that have maximum internal connectivity and mac uh, maximum internal, minimum external connectivity. Um, they help you understand which groups of your towers are functioning together as a unit, and if you find that, you're, that you, you don't understand why something in one section of your network is taking so long to talk to something in the other section of your network, well, it, it may be that clusters, um, clusters can help you understand that a little better. Uh, you can find shortest paths, uh, which in this case would be you know, quickest connection speed uh, from one microwave tower to another, um, and you can use algorithms such as disjoint paths and minimum cut to find out how difficult it is to isolate one section of your network to another. So if a device goes down inside of this microwave network, how bad will that be for the connectivity? Right? So using these types of analysis algorithms, you can really understand and increase the robustness of a network um, and help yourself get a better uh, quality of service to your customers. Right, uh, and the last of the examples that I'm going to go into um, is business process management. Um, so business process management is obviously a great big field, um, and there are lots of ways that people have tried to approach this over time. And so we're just going to talk about how using this unified data and visualization approach can help you achieve the kind of results that you really want in a business process management application. Right? So you want your managers to be able to build templates to define processes. You want users to be able to go in, uh, users being uh, workers uh, in this case, uh, to customize these task templates for their specific tasks, assign specific people to them, assign ownership. Um, you want to be able to assign ownership within subtasks. Uh, and then you want to be able to track and edit progress, and you want all of this to happen in a unified way that associates task progress with, for example, you know, shipping notifications in your database or um, you know, a, a status from uh, one of your uh, technicians saying that a particular job has been completed or that a customer has been talked to. right? So here we can see this is a sample business process management application. Um, on the right, you see a pretty familiar looking uh, business process flowchart if you've worked in this area very much. Uh, on the left, you can see a tree view, and this tree view is tracking the types of tasks that exist and to whom those tasks are assigned. You can also see uh, that some of the tasks are more complete than others by the bars that are along the top. And, the, uh, and, and you can edit these interactively uh, down in the inspector panel in the bottom left here. So you want to 
be able to use this interface. As I said, you want to assign roles to those users. Um, you want to have them at the template level and at the bottom level, and having uh, at, at the instance level. Um, and you want to be able to reveal certain options only at certain levels. Right? You want the template options to be available to management. Uh, you want assigning people to certain roles to be available to everyone. Uh, and this is all very easy um, to manage when you have this architecture where you take data from a back end uh, from a variety of sources. You unify it into a single model that is going to drive your visualization. And then you push from that data model out into a visualization that is appropriate to your user. So in this case, what that means is that you will have very similar looking but different functioning uh, views. So user roles uh, in templates, uh, assign names to the roles in specific instances, and then even modifying the instances without modifying the templates um, are all things that need to get done, but you don't necessarily want everyone to be able to do each of those things. Uh, you want tasks and entire flows to be assigned to users in a queryable way, right? So if you've got a database of all these tasks and you're a manager and you want to see, oh, what are the what are the tasks that are currently waiting on me? What are the tasks that I need to assign out? Um, how are the people in my group doing, right? Because you've got all of this driven by data, these aren't, you know, this isn't a, a Visio file that lives on somebody's desktop. This is a a real data-driven object that you can store in a database. Um, you can uh, make changes to the data that are reflected in the drawings. Uh, and you can, again, just as in the case of cable schematics, you can use changes that you make in the UI. right? So you can, you, you can mark in the drawing a uh, task as complete, and then in the database it will mark that task as complete. Right? And so that may have implications for other processes in the database that may fire off events that uh, live elsewhere. But you can use this visual space that is very easy for people to understand uh, to create the kinds of intuitive interactions uh, that really help enhance uh, usability in an application. So uh, at this point, just going to do a quick recap of some of the problems that uh, you can solve with visualization. All right, so you can use federated data, right, data from all of the sources around the network um, to help create these drawings that are nested to represent large data sets in a comprehensible way, showing only the level of detail that's relevant to you, uh, and power of visualization to solve tasks in the Grid, uh, grid monitoring space. Uh, you can use advanced layout uh, to expedite the creation of schematics, uh, either cable schematics or electronic schematics or any schematic that you need to generate. Um, you can use linked views and analysis to create this high density of information that helps increase your value to your users. And you can use data-driven process definitions to create and track workflows in a way that allows all of your back end to empower your users to create the best possible experience. At this point, uh, since we've kind of flown over a bunch of examples at a very high level, I'm going to pass off to Dave Gunwin from CenturyLink, who's going to talk about uh, his application at a much more detailed view so that you can see what a, uh, not just a proof of concept, but what a real application actually looks like. Hi, um, my name is Dave Gunawan, um, and I work for CenturyLink, uh, and specifically in the group called NROC, uh, Network Reliability Operation Center. And my task is to help the Network Operation Center technicians uh, do their job more efficient. And for this uh, particular presentation, I'm going to share with you of how um, a tool 
uh, from Tom Sawyer, the visualization software specifically. Um, the Tom Sawyer perspective help uh, us um, when particularly for this presentation, we can build uh, a very quickly a tool, uh, not just provisioning tool uh, for our network, but uh, a migration tool for our internet service from a certain type of technology to a different kind of technology. So I'm just going to go ahead with the next slides here. Um, well, the most exciting part of the slide, I guess. Uh, just a little background about ourselves. We are the third largest telco in the U.S. Uh, we have a more than 25K Metro Ethernet switches uh, and over 30K customer service, uh, which I believe now is <coughs> already over that. Um, this slide, I made it last year. Uh, we have presence in 37 states. Uh, we just had a merger two years ago with uh, Baby Bell, U.S. West, formerly U.S. West uh, Quest. Um, so we get uh, over 40 LADA local area uh, uh, from the Baby Bell area. Um, and Ethernet service currently is our major business. Uh, it uh, probably over 55% growth in the last year are in this business uh, right now. Uh, we still have landline, uh, but uh, that's a continual decreasing, of course, uh, and the other type of network, ATM frame relay, but uh, Ethernet is the, <coughs> the biggest growth in the industry right now as well as in our um, company. And we serve all different kind of uh, customers from mom and pop shop with just one local area, so their land, uh, connecting them with the public Internet or two sites uh, between a uh, small uh, business, maybe like a dentist or uh, all the way to uh, the biggest customers, uh, which are the mobile carriers, the cell phone carriers in the U.S. Uh, we are connecting their cell towers with, uh, with their MITSO, the mobile central office, uh, through uh, Ethernet service uh, in our backbone. And <coughs> so uh, for this particular uh, example that I'm presenting here, um, why uh, Ethernet service migration tool? Well, we have a existing, um, well, before I go there, uh, technology and the networking always changing. We always uh, continually have a, a different type of uh, Ethernet technology coming up, and there's always a, it's always evolving. So we need to have a way to actually migrate from uh, a certain type of technology to a different one. And in this case, for an example, is from an old dot one q signing tree base to a PPLS. And we need to do that in a uh, efficient way uh, because we always have a, a service level agreement with our customers, uh, which means we need to do it very fast and error free. Um, if we let uh, a human do this by hand, uh, there, there is a potential or a great potential of error actually occur because uh, it's not an easy way to do uh, and it's a very tedious work uh, because a lot of error can happen. Uh, it can take a lot of time um, from our study uh, by just doing a manual in a simple uh, single customer internet service. It could take about an average about two hours to three hours uh, and we want to do it in under two minutes. And we also, of course, we do not have the massive amount of uh, technicians uh, for the volume of Ethernet service we have. It could take probably uh, years and years to complete all of them. Uh, we just can't afford that. So um, with that in mind, we also uh, would like to have this uh, tool can be run by a uh, lower grade technicians because uh, in order to do it by hand manually, you need a higher grade technician to do the whole thing, and uh, that's something just not economically feasible. 
So um, now, in order to do this tool, uh, of course, uh, it's a tier approach. We can't just build the tool right away. We need to, to build the building blocks. Um, the tool is going to be built upon on top of other tools. We can't just go straight into uh, this tool because this is a highly complex networking tool. And we, we need to build the, the basic of it first. So uh, in our environment, we have a multi-vendor uh, networks where we, we have switches from different vendors. Um, and in order to get a visibility to our network, uh, a unified visibility, uh, we need to build a homegrown tool because uh, there is no tools out there in the market uh, that provide us with that. Each vendor only provides uh, insight into their own uh, uh, network elements. And we can't just let uh, our technician to swivel chair from one screen to a different screen uh, and try to stitch all of them together on a piece of paper. So this is the, basically the building tools that we need to build. So it's basically an internet service discovery tool that we need to build first. And our search come to this uh, software from Tom Sawyer perspective where we actually can uh, apply the, um, a very quick um, uh, uh, well it's not really a team actually we can actually uh, assemble the, uh, a small group of uh, subject matter experts from the network operations and build a tool within our own group. And with this uh, internet service uh, discovery tool, we can uh, actually give our network operation center technician, which is the tier one, also an audit tool. Uh, so uh, when the customer called, uh, they can launch the tool immediately. Uh, the tool uh, with this Tom Sawyer, can uh, we built a discovery engine that can query uh, and discover it directly from the network, pull all the data and information, uh, flash it to their screen uh, using the Tom Sawyer uh, visualizations, as well as also pulling data from our network inventory database and uh, lay them all together as, uh, at the same time, and then. Uh, we also built a custom logic to actually do a comparison so they can immediately tell uh, if there's any discrepancies. Uh, also, there's a logic that we built in this tool to actually show if there's any um, error in the network itself. Uh, so this is the first tool that we built, which is the building block uh, to go to the, net, uh, the next more complex tool, uh, which is the provisioning or migration tools. So. I'll go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> and we have a very aggressive timeline. And again, um, because we found this uh, Tom Sawyer visualization software, um, I can just go to uh, my management and said that um, we can build this uh, customer service discovery tool only in three months. Uh, I also need to build an infrastructure service discovery tool also in three months, and another three months again for uh, build the real tool, which is the provisioning uh, or migration tool. And all of, all of this actually only need one resource, which is myself. And again, my, the resource here, here is uh, the subject matter expert itself in the network operation uh, group uh, without involving any IT uh, department itself. And for those of you who are like in a software, uh, this is probably a, uh, an interesting picture. And uh, I'm just going to show this a little bit on how I built the software for uh, all of the tools. Um, and I'm just I'm not going to go into much detail in it. This is just uh, um, information on how I built the tools. Um, now. This is more exciting uh, slides, actually. This is the uh, internet service topology uh, that uh, we built the first time. Uh, this shows a, a 
a specific uh, customer, our Ethernet customer. Um, we have a core of EPLS in the middle with the uh, .1Q and the edges. Um, it shows all of the connection and the nodes, and it pulls information not only from the network itself, but also pull it from the network uh, invent inventory table. So it shows uh, the real state of the uh, network itself, as well as the um, static data, which is like maybe the customer's name, customer address, uh, um, and all of that uh, customer-specific information. So it, it put them all together in one picture, uh, so the uh, technicians, when they try to do uh, analysis or an audit uh, because of a problem, they can see it all in one visualization here. Um, and it does a real-time discovery, and they know right away, uh, and this is meaning it's not something that uh, has been a while because of a past discovery. This is like a real-time discovery. Uh, so this is the first tool that we built. Um, this is the infrastructure service discovery tool. Uh, we use an ISIS. Uh, also, we use BGP layer 2 VPN. Uh, this is for a different group, and it's very useful for them to check uh, the integrity of the core. Um, and these are all like the basic building blocks for building the next uh, more complex tool, which is I'm going to discuss here, which is the provisioning tool, which and this is a provisioning more even specific because this is a migration. It's not like a, a greenfield uh, provisioning, which we also have, by the way. So uh, for a migration here, um, this tool is provided for uh, a bunch of our technicians. Uh, so they're on call with the customer. And during the main window, they can just run this tool while um, Online with the customers because uh, it's going to take like about two minute hits to their network. Uh, so they launch the tool. The tool is going to do some verification to the customers uh, and the network. And I'm just going to skip to the you know more exciting part here, uh, which is the discovery. Uh, and this, like you can see, this discovery is very similar to the the previous slides because it's actually the same engine, and that's why I said uh, this is a, a building blocks uh, software be uh, because this is utilizing what we have built before. So the tool here, uh, before actually doing a migration, it, it, it discovered what in the network first. Um, and as you can see that for those of you who have a background in the networking, and it shows that this is in a dot one Q in spanning tree and that's a spanning tree and I apologize I can't get a real uh, picture of a real customer here because I can't get the approval from uh, our company these are this looks very simple because this is our lab uh, nodes our lab network um, so it discovered what's uh, the existing one um, and then I'm just gonna go flip through pretty fast here because I don't want to go much into details, but basically what it's doing is it's uh, and interacting with the user, which is the technicians, and ask them whether uh, the picture okay, looks fine, and then when they're ready and the customer is ready, uh, we, the tool uh, has an algorithm that we built into it to actually uh, go through the node and links, do some analysis, and have the smartness to actually dismantle the existing Ethernet service. And it does that automatically into the network itself. And upon completion, it uh, visualizes itself again in the tool. As you can see here, it becoming a dotted line, a gray dotted line, which means uh, it successfully dismantled some of the uh, Ethernet service, as well as removing the VLAN. and now the network is uh, ready for a new type of technology, which is in the VPLS. And another logic actually will come in and build uh, the, the network for the customer in the new v 
PPLS type of service here. As you can see that with the, the new dotted line there. And again, now it's a green, and the, VP, the customer now is in a PPLS type of service. So that's basically what uh, we did with the Tom Sawyer perspective. And um, this has been used successfully in the past. Um, and in summary, I can say that um, the power of this uh, visualization tool is that um, because it's so easy to work with, uh, it enabled us people from the network operation itself, which is the subject matter expert, to actually build our own tool. Uh, it frees us from the uh, IT and the whole army of developers, specifically graphic developers, to deliver a tool or a software or uh, something for us um, because we can just do it by ourselves. Um, it also reduces the cost, of course, because now we don't have to really engage uh, a bunch of IT developers. And again, because us, the subject matter expert itself, that doing and delivering the tool for ourselves, uh, we get a faster turnaround and delivery time. And the cost is also, I would say, not only coming from not uh, reducing the software cost, but also from delivering this tool itself. Like I said, the study before <coughs> when uh, we had the, uh, somebody doing this manually, it could take about two to three hours, and now um, we can reduce it by two minutes. It's, uh, it's a huge saving for the company. And we, <coughs> because of that, uh, I would say this, uh, this uh, software visualization tool from Tom Sawyer is a really huge uh, um, investment, uh, return of investment from this uh, software is really huge for us. Um, so that's basically what I have. Um, I'll just gonna turn this back to uh, the moderator and if there's any question and answer, that's, uh, that's great. That's great. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Dave. Um, we've got uh, just over 10 minutes left here. Um, we've got a few questions that have come in. Just to remind everybody that uh, uh, they can post questions here and we will uh, endeavor to get uh, answers to them while we're, uh, we've still got time. So let me just um, pick up on a couple that have come through. Um, I think this one is for you, Josh. Um, most of the examples we've seen of Tom Sawyer Solutions have been for use by internal technicians or salespeople to improve customer service. Are there any applications that use Tom Sawyer in a direct customer-facing capacity? Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah. So. Most of the applications that use Tom Sawyer are internal, uh, and the reason for that is that you can deliver a lot of power, uh, especially to people who you have trained uh, to understand the visualization well. Uh, and I think that Dave's application uh, really shows that uh, from the perspective of CenturyLink um, basically uh, letting their technicians do something at 60 times the original speed or whatever it was. Uh, however, it is also the case that we are used uh, directly in some consumer-facing applications. Um, typically, they're used for viewing uh, records of transactions or for viewing you know, social networking data like um, with regard to Twitter or Facebook messages or emails, um, and that, uh, that that really let people see what's happening uh, in the back end of of some piece of information that they're interested in. Uh, so yes, yeah, so you can definitely use visualization to help your customers directly see and understand the things that they're interested in learning about. Um, uh, in addition to using it for these sort of internal applications. 
Okay, good. Thanks for that, uh, Josh. Um, got another one here. I think it's probably for you, Dave, actually. Um, what system provides the service inventory? Is it within the Tom Sawyer software solution suite? Dave? Yes, uh, I'm sorry. So the service inventory is, uh, we have it in Oracle database. And um, I, I think uh, Josh can answer this, but uh, Tom Sawyer provided uh, several, uh, what they call integrator, to several databases. Um, it's just that we only use one type of database, which is uh, Oracle. And when I build the tools, I use Java. And I build it with Swing GUI. And there are a bunch of uh, uh, API provided uh, classes from Tom Sawyer that I can use um, to connect with the database. I don't know, Josh, you want to add to it? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so Dave uh, mentioned that he's using an Oracle database with a Tom Sawyer integrator. Um, basically, we have this concept of an integrator that's very much like, uh, for example, a data ingester for a database um, that allows you to define rules that turn the contents of some data source into uh, real like live in-memory data uh, that you can use to power your uh, visualization application. Um, Dave is using a, uh, an Oracle database, but we can also connect uh, to any JDBC data. We can connect to uh, Neo4j. Uh, we have examples using Infinite Graph. We have uh, XML. Uh, a lot of times people want to post specific uh, pieces of data as XML formats at a specified uh, URL, and we can just go grab them from there. Uh, you can even do it with Excel or formatted text. Um, we've got other stuff like that coming in the works. So uh, Tom Sawyer uh, at this time doesn't have any uh, data hosting in itself. Uh, you can also connect to in-memory uh, in memory data that's, that's used by other portions of your application. Um, but you can connect to whatever outside data sources you need, and, and we use that extensively in our uh, data federation approach. Okay, that's good, uh, um, Josh. Just, I mean, just related to that, this, this other question has come in around migration tool screens. Um, are, are they also built by yourselves, or is that something that um, customers typically do themselves? Well, I can answer that. So I think I, I mentioned that earlier that uh, I built the migration tool in Java with Swing GUI. Uh, and inside the Swing GUI, there is a component uh, inside the frame. And those components, I use Tom Sawyer components. Uh, so for example, like the um, – um, and Josh can uh, – correct me on this, but uh, there are several uh, major components there. There's like uh, the tree components, there are table components, there's the uh, the note links, I forgot what they call it, uh, where you have the visualization of or the topology itself, uh, and you have the specter components. So those components I can just call it through uh, the import from the uh, Tom Sawyer uh, it, API or JAR file itself. Yeah, to follow up on that just a little bit, uh, uh, what Dave said is uh, is correct. Um, basically, uh, your Tom Sawyer level provides uh, things like the drawing view is what we call the topology view, uh, or a, a geographical map. We can actually uh, use Google Maps, um, tables and trees, uh, and inspectors that provide all these data views as Tom Sawyer components. And you can either uh, embed them in a, uh, in a desktop swing application or in a .NET desktop application uh, or the exact same 
components are available as pure HTML5 and JavaScript components uh, that you can plug into an HTML page. Uh, so the application itself is not necessarily built with Tom Sawyer, but the visualization components and the data components that you see are all very easy to create uh, in perspectives, and then you plug in those Tom Sawyer uh, components into your application. Okay. Josh, we've got another one there that's come in. Um, do you have your own discovery tool? Uh, so we, we do not have a built-in network discovery tool or data discovery tool. However, um, at the API level, you have access to anything you can do in Java uh, or anything you can do at .NET. Uh, so it's very easy. Usually people have um, – when they come to us, they have some idea that they have they have a network discovery um, or a data discovery tool, and then they want to add a visualization on top of it. Uh, we've helped people uh, develop and improve their own data discovery tools uh, in the past, but we we don't have one that comes out of the box. And uh, I think I can add to it. Uh, so from the customer of Tom Sawyer perspective. Uh, of course, we have a very distinct and very different network from any other service provider, from any other telco. So it's something, the discovery engine itself is something that we build in-house. Uh, like I said, we have a multi-vendor environment. So I have a, a, a discovery tool that can span across different vendors uh, and normalize uh, the results where I put all of those results into uh, Tom Sawyer for visualization. So uh, again, like I just said, the Tom Sawyer is just a visualization tool. It doesn't have any logic into it. Uh, we built our own custom logic for discovery. OK. Um, got another one here, which um, is quite detailed, but I'll, I'll bring it up anyhow. You mentioned. I think it's probably for you, Josh. You mentioned that you determine what common schema is to drive what your visualization looks like. How does that relate to that schema-less like Neo4j, Infinite Graph, and other similar their SQL uh, databases? All right. Uh, yeah, so we can talk about that uh, a little bit. So Tom Sawyer, um, in order to create a visualization, needs to have a data model that can tell us, for example, uh, which element of uh, or, or which attribute of, of this data element represents the status, right? Which should tell us that this is a critical device. Um, and what that means is that you have to create some basic schema uh, that doesn't need to be comprehensive uh, that covers the way that you want to turn your back-end data into viewable front-end data. Uh, we have some tools that help, uh, that help you translate from a schemaless data source like Neo4j, um, or uh, it's obviously easier with like an Oracle data source. But if you have a schemaless data source, typically uh, your developers know what are the things that they want to see uh, and so you just need to create a mapping from the things that you want to see in your back end uh, to a schema in, in the Tom Sawyer level. And so that allows you to, even if the database that you're connecting to is schemaless in a broad sense, just key, on, key in on those few attributes uh, that need to drive your visualization so that you don't have to uh, you know, tear your hair out dealing with all of the different permutations that could possibly occur of the attributes that exist on an element. Okay, Josh, that's <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, thanks for that. Um, just wanted to check to see if there's any other final comments uh, yourself, uh, Josh or David, uh, you want to make. Uh, we've got. To about a minute left before we uh, finish up here. Uh, while you're just thinking about that, um, clearly I'd like to thank uh, for uh, sponsoring this webinar and obviously for yourselves uh, 
uh, for both presenting and also those that are attending and listening uh, to this. Um, so Josh or David, any final comments? Uh, no, I'd just like to thank everyone for listening and uh, sitting through the presentation. Okay. Thank you and good day to everybody.